It seems so long ago Seems so far away But it's as clear as though Another man is gone He didn't last the night But he helped us see the dawn And the light Mark Lane, attorney and author of the book Rushed to judgment. The assassination of President Kennedy was not just a national tragedy, but an event of historic and heroic dimensions. Minor characters on life's stage are profoundly affected when men of heroic stature are struck down. And through the observations of such minor characters in life as in drama, there is much we may learn from the event. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern were but inadvertent messengers in the tragedy of Hamlet. But like Roger Craig, they were swept away by events they could not control, could in fact barely fathom. During this program, we will witness events many of us would like to forget. Well over a decade after the murder, perplexing questions still remain deep in the American consciousness, and we cannot forget, just as Roger Craig could not forget. This program is, in a sense, the story of a man whose dedication to the truth epitomized the moral fiber of an ordinary person, Roger Craig. Roger Dean Craig, former Dallas County Deputy Sheriff, winner of the Man of the Year Award in 1960 for law enforcement in recognition of outstanding performance in the line of duty. Roger Craig was a trained, alert, and instinctive police officer. He was interviewed by Lincoln Carl in April 1974. Uh, where were you on the day of the assassination of John Kennedy? I was standing out in front of the uh, sheriff's office, which at that time was at 505 Main Street. They've moved it since then, but uh, it was at 505 Main Street, directly in front of the front door. Uh, was the motorcade passing that area at that time? No, we had to wait about 15 minutes before the motorcade arrived but uh, the sheriff had sent us out there that early to wait. Uh, were you merely a spectator or were you on duty? Uh, well, no, I was on duty, but uh, a couple hours before Kennedy was to arrive, uh, the sheriff called us in, what I call the street people, the plainclothesmen, the detectives, and uh, he instructed us that we were to stand out in front and in no way take part in the security of that motorcade that we were merely spectators and nothing more. Did that seem unusual to you? It did to me at the time because uh, there were so many people around and so few Dallas police officers. This is one of the first things I noticed was the lack of Dallas police officers try to keep the people back. Adley Stevenson, who had been assaulted in Dallas the previous month, and others, including Congressman Henry Gonzalez, from San Antonio, Texas, had warned President Kennedy not to travel through Dallas. But the Secret Service told the President that he had nothing to worry about, since the greatest security in the history of the country for an American President, comprised of the coordination of all the local and federal police, had been set up for Dallas. Yet Roger Craig, an intelligent, instinctive police officer, and many other police officers, were specifically told not to take part in the security that day. And Dallas-based FBI agent James Hosty, assigned to Lee Harvey Oswald, Oswald who had just returned from the Soviet Union, Oswald who was a high security threat by FBI standards. Mr. Hosty had no assignment to protect the president that day either. Hosty told a congressional investigating committee many years later that he was having lunch down the street 
when the president was killed. The greatest security ever, even the normal security on both the federal and local levels had been stripped away. Uh, the president came by and they made the right turn on to Houston Street. And, oh, I'll say, you know, a few seconds later, give them time to get to Elm Street and make the left, I heard what was a, what I call a report, a gunshot. And I said, oh, I said, oh my God. And I turned and started toward Houston Street, running just as hard as I could. And I was probably 15 steps from Houston Street. And before I reached those 15 steps, I heard two more reports. Then you arrived at Elm Street. Right. Okay, what did you see? Well, there was a Dallas police officer running up the grassy knoll to the picket fence. So I immediately assumed the motorcade had, had left by then. And I immediately assumed that he knew something about the shots or he wouldn't have been headed for the picket fence. So I followed him. Were you aware the president had been hit? Not at that time. Now, uh, people were mentioning the president was shot and someone else said a Secret Service agent was shot. And there were just stories flying all over. But my interest was to get behind that picket fence because that's where that Dallas police officer was headed. And uh, he was in the motorcade. It was motorcycle, or he was a traffic officer. I worked in that area for, oh, probably, oh, seven, eight minutes, maybe, something like that, mm -hmm. until I ran on to uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Arnold Rowland. Now, Mr. Rowland told me that 15 minutes before the motorcade arrived, he saw two men on the sixth floor of the school book depository. Now, one was a white male in the east corner of the sixth floor with a rifle. The other one was a colored male at the west end of the sixth floor, floor pacing back and forth. Although Craig had not been assigned to the motorcade detail, he began gathering evidence and taking statements from witnesses almost immediately after the shots were fired. His interview with Roland was important, for if Roland saw two men on the sixth floor, one of whom held a rifle, then the Warren Commission's preconception of a lone assassin would have been challenged immediately. Craig noted and accurately repeated Roland's words, although the FBI agent, who had also interviewed Roland in Dealey Plaza, did not. Roland told the Warren Commission when he testified, quote, the FBI agents didn't seem very interested in the other man on the sixth floor, close quote, and that the FBI agent, quote, deleted and omitted any reference to the other man in his report to the Warren Commission. And I went uh, to the <clears throat> south side of Elm Street to look for any uh, signs of any bullet striking the curb or the street or anything. Uh, by this time it had been established that the president had been shot. And uh, Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walters joined me at that time. Everybody was coming to the scene of the shooting, you know, which is normal. You know, people are just that way. But as I was searching the south curb of Elm Street, I heard a shrill whistle. And I looked up, it just drew my attention. It was coming from across the street. And there was a light green Rambler station wagon driving real slow west on Elm Street. And the driver was leaning over to his right, looking up at a man running down the grass. So I immediately tried to cross the street to take these two people into custody for questioning. Just, you know, everybody else was coming to the scene. These were the only two people leaving. I mean, this was suspicious in my mind, you know, at the time. So I wanted to talk to them. But I couldn't get across the street because the city officer who was stationed at Houston and Elm had left his post and the traffic, you know, was so heavy, I just couldn't get across the street to him. But I did get a good look at the man coming down the grassy knoll. 
and he got in the station wagon, and they drove west on Elm Street. The man that Roger Craig saw running down the grassy knoll and riding off in a light-colored station wagon was Lee Harvey Oswald. It had been determined that the uh, shots came from the southeast window. How, I don't know, the Dallas police were saying this, so we immediately went there. And uh, Deputy Sheriff Luke Mooney was with me when we found the shells. We found three hulls beside the window on the sixth floor. And uh, they were laying three in a row, not more than this an inch. This was of brass, the three spent yes, cartridges? three huh? spent cartridges. They were li lying three in a row, not more than an inch apart, all pointing in the same direction. Of course, I didn't touch them. They hadn't been photographed or fingerprinted or anything. I didn't touch those. And uh, there was a lunch sack, very small, brown paper lunch sack up there. Had some chicken bones in it. And uh, there was a soda bottle sitting on a box. And we began then to uh, search for a weapon. And we started toward, uh, everybody took a different direction. And uh, Deputy Sheriff Boone, and myself just happened to head for the northwest corner of the building. <clears throat> and uh, Boone was ahead of me by about eight feet. And there was a, there were a stack of boxes uh, just at the head of the stairwell going downstairs. And Boone looked over into it and said, here it is, here's the rifle. So I immediately went over beside him and looked over, and there was a rifle. But we didn't touch it until Captain Fritz and Lieutenant Day from the ID department of the Dallas Police Department got there. Now, Captain Fritz was chief of homicide, and Lieutenant Day was from the Identification Bureau. They got there and uh, took some pictures of the rifle, and then uh, I believe Day pulled the rifle out and handed it to Captain Fritz, who held it up by the, uh, had a strap on it. He held it up by the strap and asked if anyone knew what kind of rifle it was. Well, by this time, Deputy Constable Seymour Weitzman had joined us. And uh, Weitzman was a, uh, gun buff. He had a sporting goods store at one time, and he was very good at, with weapons. And he said, it looks like a Mauser. And he walked over to Fritz, and Captain Fritz was holding the rifle up in the air, and I was standing next to Weitzman, who was standing next to Fritz, and we weren't any more than six or eight inches from the rifle, and stamped right on the barrel of the rifle was 7.65 Mauser. And that's when Weitzman said it is a Mauser and pointed to the 7.65 Mauser stamp on the barrel. There's an intonation to that statement that it should mean something. Well, the shells we found came from a 6.5 Italian rifle. You mean those three the, cartridges? The two don't relate. Were, three cartridges that were found Not at the southeast an corner in the southeast corner came from a 6.5 italian carbine the strongest element in the case against lee harvey oswald was the warren commission's conclusion that his rifle had been found on the sixth floor of the book depository building yet oswald never owned a 7.65 mauser when the fbi later reported that oswald had purchased only a 6.5 Italian Manlucker Carcano, the weapon at police headquarters in Dallas miraculously changed its size, its make, and its nationality. The Warren Commission concluded that a 6.5 Manlucker Carcano, not a 7.65 German Mauser, had been discovered by the Dallas deputies. Yet Roger Craig's observation was supported by this affidavit signed by Dallas Deputy Constable Seymour Weitzman on November 23, 1963, in which he swore that he did discover a, quote, 7.65 Mauser, bolt action, equipped with a 4-slash-18 scope,
with a thick leather brownish black sling to it, close quote. One of the members of the Warren Commission, then Congressman Gerald R. Ford of Grand Rapids, Michigan, wrote that the rumor that a German Mauser had been found was based upon a police officer having told a passing reporter that he thought he might have seen a Mauser. That explanation appears to be false. In view of Craig's statement, Weitzman's affidavit, a copy of which I gave to the Warren Commission and to Congressman Ford in 1964, and in the face of newly discovered documents, which we have just secured from the CIA files after having made an application under the newly amended Freedom of Information Act. Roger Craig never saw these documents, but they offer very strong corroboration for his statement. This CIA report, dated November 25, 1963, just three days after the assassination, states that the murder weapon was a Mauser. And this CIA report, three days later, specifically states that the assertion, which later became the Warren Commission's cornerstone in the case against Oswald, the assertion that the murder weapon was a Manlicher Carcano, is in error. Thus, Craig's original observation, buttressed by Deputy Constable Weitzman and the CIA's investigation, tends to destroy the case against Oswald. Were there any slugs found? 145 slug. It was found on the south side of Elm Street. Outside? Outside on the grass. It was lying amongst, if you excuse the gruesomeness of it, part of uh, uh, hair and blood and bone matter. The Warren report concluded that three 6.5 caliber bullets were fired by Oswald and that no other bullets were fired that day since Oswald had acted alone. Yet here are photographs of the scene that Roger Craig had observed that day. Craig said that he and Deputy Buddy Walther observed an FBI agent reach for and pick up a 45 caliber slug, then leave the scene with it clutched in his hand. These photographs show Deputy Walther and the FBI agent. This is the film depicting the assassination. The bullet that struck President Kennedy in the head and killed him drove him backward as if it came from the right front, not as if it had been fired from the book depository which was behind him. When the bullet struck the president in the head, it drove him backward, suddenly and violently. None of those in front of the president were splattered with blood or brain matter. Yet patrolman Billy Hargis, the police officer riding to the left rear of the president, testified, quote, I was just a little back and to the left of the president. I got splattered with blood, close quote. And the impact of the brain material almost knocked him off of his motorcycle. Further corroboration for Craig's observation that leads to the conclusion that the fatal shot came from the front rather than from the rear comes from the eyewitnesses. On March 28, 1966, I interviewed one such witness in Dallas, Charles Brem. Mr. Brem, where were you on November 22nd, 1963? I had taken my five-year-old son downtown to see the presidential parade. This is a picture taken by Mr. Nix of the limousine at the time the shots were fired. Do you see yourself and your boy in that picture? Yes, sir, this is myself and this is my son on this frame here where the first shot hit the president. I would say that the 
he was possibly 30 feet away when the first bullet struck, moved a little closer and was possibly 20 to 25 feet away when the second bullet hit. Did you see the effect of the bullets upon the president? Uh, when the second bullet hit, uh, there was the hair seemed to go flying. Uh, it was very definite then that he was struck in the head with the second bullet. And uh, yes, sir, I, I very definitely saw effects of the second bullet. Did you see any particles of the president's skull fly when the bullet struck him in the head? I saw a piece fly over, oh, in the area of the curb where I was standing. And in which direction did that fly? It seemed to have, have come left and back. In other words, the skull particle flew to the left and to the rear of the presidential limousine. Uh, sir, whatever it was that I saw did fall both in that direction and over into the curb there. You were a ranger during the war, correct? Yes, sir, I was a ranger during the war. Took part in the invasion of France and was shot a couple of times. So, uh, as I say, it's possibly like swimming. Uh, I hadn't heard that sound for many a year, but you don't forget it once, uh, once you've heard a shot rounding, coming close to you. Did you make a statement to the Dallas Sheriff's Office? Yes, I did. How long did you remain in the Dallas Sheriff's Office that day? I was, say, about three hours to four hours. Were you among the closest witnesses to the limousine when the shot struck the president? Yes, sir, I would have to say that uh, uh, if not the closest, one of the closest to the unfortunate incident, uh, I did get a view of something I'll never forget. Were you called as a witness by the Warren Commission? No, I was not called by the Warren Commission to testify. You speak with newsmen on November 22nd and tell them what you saw. Yes, sir, and told them simply that there two shots had hit the president and the direction that I had thought the bullets had come from. Did you at any time that day make a statement which was televised? Yes, sir. Fortunately, I was probably 15 to 20 feet away from the president when it happened. Tell us exactly what you saw, sir. <laughs> he was coming down the street, and my five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass there on Commerce Street, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved, and the man... The man... That's all right, sir. You were ahead and Because he was waving back, he was... He was the shot rang out and he slumped down in the seat and his wife reached up toward him and uh, he, uh, he, he was slumping down and the second shot went off and it just knocked him down from, from the seat. I'm positive that it hit him. I hope it didn't, but I'm positive that it hit him and, it, and he went all the way down in the car. Then they speeded up and I didn't know what was going on, so I just grabbed the boy and fell on him in hopes that there wasn't a maniac around. I'm sorry. I can't help you more, but I, I won't forget it. <laughs> that afternoon, after Officer Tippett was killed, they took a suspect into custody. And uh, I, got, I was thinking about this man getting away from me. This and was I, the man that got into the Green Rambler. The Green Rambler. And I called Captain Fritz at his office and gave him a description of the man I saw get into the Rambler. And uh, he told me, and I quote him, it sounds like the suspect we have in custody. Come on up and take a look at him. So I went out and got in my unmarked car and drove to the uh, city hall, went directly to Captain Fritz's office. And uh, we went into Captain Fritz's inner office. And uh, the man was sitting in a chair behind a desk. And there was another gentleman. I assumed he was one of Fritz's people because he had the white cowboy hat on, which was the trademark at that time of the Dallas I Homicide Bureau. And Fritz turned to me and said, is this the man you saw? And I said, yes. And it was. 
it was. So he turned to the suspect and he said, this man saw you leave, at which time the suspect became a little excited. And he said, I told you people I did. And Fritz said, now take it easy, son, talking to the suspect. He said, we're just trying to find out what happened here. He said, what about the car? I didn't say station wagon. He said, what about the car? At which time the suspect leaned forward and put both hands up on the desk and said, that station wagon belongs to Mrs. Payne. Don't try to drag her into this. Mrs. Payne and her friends had played a major role in the life of Lee Harvey Oswald. She brought Oswald's wife to Texas from New Orleans and invited her to live in her home. Oswald came to Dallas from Louisiana because of Mrs. Payne. Mrs. Payne and her friends got Oswald a job in the book depository building on the president's motorcade route. And after Oswald was arrested, Mrs. Payne told him she would get a lawyer for him. He relied upon Mrs. Payne to get him an attorney. She never did call a lawyer, and Oswald died without having been able to give his side of the story to counsel. Mrs. Payne owned a light-colored station wagon. Then he leaned back and very disgustedly said, everybody will know who I am now. Now this was not a brag. I know it's been blown up to be a brag in the Warren Commission. But this was not a brag. This was a man that, that uh, he was catch in a building at night, you know, after it's locked. Mm -hmm. This is like uh, uh, somebody who's trying to steal something mm -hmm. and you catch him at it. it was, uh, he was embarrassed about it. Or disgusted that he had, had mm -hmm. uh, uh, blown his cover or, mm -hmm. or, or been caught or, or something. You know, it, uh, it wasn't a brag. Craig's crucial observation that Oswald feared that his cover might be blown is better understood in the context of newly discovered information. Arrest Pena, a man who worked for the FBI in New Orleans in 1963, has recently said that Oswald also worked for the FBI in New Orleans at that time and that they were supervised by the same FBI agent, Warren DeBreeze. Pena said that he was afraid to tell that to the Warren Commission because Warren DeBreeze, now the special agent for the FBI in charge of their office in San Juan, Puerto Rico, threatened to kill him if he testified truthfully before the Warren Commission. And William Walter, who was in charge of the New Orleans FBI office from midnight to 8 a.m. during that time frame, recently said that the records which he examined constrained him to conclude that Oswald did work for the FBI in 1963. Oswald was questioned for more than 12 hours by seven FBI agents during the 48 hours he was permitted to live while in custody. There is no record of what Oswald told the FBI. No tape recording, no stenographic record, and even the few notes jotted down by the FBI agents were destroyed by those FBI agents. All that remains of Oswald's response while in custody are the brief interviews conducted by the... Mr. Shanklin, you said you were taking a shower on Saturday night and you got a phone call from someone telling you that they were going to 
try and kill uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Could you tell me who that phone call was from? I don't know. Uh, the office got the call. Uh, this has in, been taken up in the Warren report. I called, uh, uh, the, the, the office got to call. I'd gone home at about 11 and I was trying to take a shower and this is the first time I'd had any chance. It's Saturday. Right. Uh, I came on back down because they couldn't get the police chief. And I came on back and then I got, finally got in touch with the deputy chief and I said, I want to talk to Chief Curry. And finally at about eight o'clock the next morning, they got him. And I told him that uh, I wanted to report this directly to him. And uh, he said, well, he had everything taken care of. He had two uh, uh, armored trucks. You were never able to determine who the call had come from? No, it, just, call? it was an anonymous call. It came into the clerk that was operating the switchboard. Uh, the same call I later found out, or the same, probably the same individual, called the sheriff's office. Uh, nothing ever happened. after Jack Ruby killed Oswald, we learn through this letter, signed by J. Edgar Hoover, and suppressed by the Warren Commission for almost a decade, that Ruby also worked for the FBI before he killed Oswald. Who was Oswald? Craig's crucial observation of him on November 22nd in Dealey Plaza and his confrontation with him a little later caused the question to be posed in 1963. More than a decade later, a congressional investigating committee was still troubled by the implications of FBI cover-up. Just recently, in winning a case in the federal district court against the Secret Service under the Freedom of Information Act, we were able to determine that the Secret Service maintained a file in 1963 with the names of one million potential threats to presidents. One million. On the average, one out of every 200 Americans were listed as potential threats. Yet Oswald, an activist for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, a man who had renounced his American citizenship in Moscow, who had sought a visa to Cuba and to the Soviet Union, who owned a rifle, and who recently secured a job on the president's motorcade route was not among the million potential threats. Was that because he worked for the FBI? Shortly before the assassination, Oswald personally delivered a letter to Special Agent James Hostie of the FBI office in Dallas. Yet the Warren Commission never saw that letter, never even learned that such a letter had been delivered. When Hostie testified before the FBI Oversight Committee of the House Judiciary Committee in 1975, he tried to explain why that had happened. Sunday, November 24th, it was at least two hours after the announced death of Lee Oswald. It could have been three or four hours afterwards. It was sometime that afternoon of November 24th, uh, Mr. Howe, told me that uh, Mr. Shanklin wanted to see me and uh, Mr. Howe in his office. What, what transpired it then? Mr. Meeting? Shanklin reached down into the lower right-hand drawer of his desk. It's a large double drawer in which he has numerous manila folders where they keep uh, various notes. There's a folder for each agent. And they keep various notations and routing slips, uh, error forms and things like that in these folders. He reached down and took out uh, the memorandum and the note in question, and he handed it to me, and he said, in effect, uh, Oswald's dead now. There can be no trial. Here, get rid of this. I then proceeded to uh, tear it up. His presence, he said, no, get it out of here. I don't, I don't even want it in this office. Get rid of it. I then took it out and destroyed it. And how did you destroy it? I took it into the uh, washroom and uh, flushed it down the drain. Did you testify before the Warren Commission? I did. 
Did you volunteer or give any information about the note or its destruction? I did not. Why not? I wasn't asked. Did you give any information or volunteer any information uh, with respect to your instructions regarding Commission Exhibit 103? No, sir. Why not? I wasn't asked. And did you think about volunteering the information? No, sir. Why not? I was instructed when I went up there uh, that I was to only answer the questions that were set to me and I was not to expand on anything and not to elaborate to only answer the questions that were put to me. And who gave you those instructions? Given to me by uh, at least two officials in uh, Dallas and at least one in, um, in uh, FBI headquarters. Uh, they were given to me by uh, Mr. Shanklin, Mr. Gimberling, who uh, was a supervisor of, who uh, succeeded Mr. Howe, and uh, also by uh, former assistant director Alan Belmont. During the years after the assassination, Roger Craig's closest friend was Penn Jones of Midlothian, Texas. Roger Craig only had a fifth grade education. He ran away from his home in Wisconsin at age 12. He made his own living on ranches in the Northwestern United States until he joined the Army at age 15. He accidentally ran into one of his brothers in the Army and uh, on learning his proper age, he was kicked out of the Army. He came to Dallas here and washed dishes until he was old enough to rejoin the Army. He rejoined the Army, had a fine combat record in Korea, came back to this city where he was hired by Sheriff Bill Decker at age 21 as the youngest deputy sheriff that Decker ever hired. Craig had a fine record as deputy sheriff, was made the man of the year in 1960 as the outstanding deputy for the year, and uh, his troubles only began when John Kennedy was killed in this plaza on November the 22nd, 1963. My name appeared in several books that had come out condemning the Warren Commission. or So people began to come from all over the country. And they'd come in and ask me if they could talk to me and ask me what happened on that day. And I saw nothing wrong with telling them what I saw and heard. You know, I gave my statement. So uh, the sheriff called me in and asked me what the people wanted that were coming down there. And I told him they just wanted to talk to me about what happened. And he said, well, you tell them when they come that you didn't see anything and you didn't hear anything. Roger Craig felt a burning desire to somehow let the American people know the truth about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He had suffered, he was no longer employed by the Dallas Sheriff's Department, and he was being harassed. He said his name had appeared in several books, and I must confess that it was in Rush to Judgment, the book which I had written, which was published way back in 1966, in which Roger Craig's name first appeared, because I considered his testimony before the Warren Commission to be very significant, not even knowing then of all the corroboration that was to come. Did the interviews keep on after you were fired, or were you continued to be? No, I tried to uh, get back to a normal way of life. You know, I had a family to support, and uh, I took a job managing a bail bond company. But uh, <clears throat> people weren't coming around so much asking me questions as they were following me. And uh, people I had known for a long time, one in particular asked me to meet him at a coffee shop at uh, Columbia and uh, Carroll Street. And so he was about an hour late, and I was sitting in my car waiting outside of his place. And these two cars kept circling the block. So we took, uh, finally he arrived, and we went over and we had our coffee. We were followed in by this man in a checkered jacket that was driving one of the cars. So by the time we finished our coffee, we started to leave. The man jumped up, and he left first. And we walked out and uh, went over to Columbia Street. We were standing on the curb, and all of a sudden, my friend fell to the ground. And I thought, well, he stumbled, you know. 
and for some reason I stepped off of the curb and when I did a shot came from behind and uh, passed over my left ear and uh, I headed for my car immediately and uh, went home. And, uh, Your friend dropped, in other words, to be out of the line the of fire. Before the shot was fired. He, yeah. Apparently he knew what was going to happen. That's my conclusion now. I was digging up some information, actually, for uh, Jim Garrison and, and, and Penn Jones, Jr. of Midlothian. I was digging up some information that they wanted, you know, in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And I parked my car on the side of the street, and I wanted to get this information. And when I came back and cranked up my car, it blew up. The engine caught fire, the hood came up, the firewall blew out. Uh, I had uh, uh, all the fuses blew and uh, oh, I was burnt in the chest area and I had pieces of glass and metal in the chest, small pieces. I don't know what they put in it, but... Uh, it's not possible the car itself could have malfunctioned, did it? Not that much of an explosion, no. Uh -uh. Somebody put a bomb in your car? Somebody put something in it. This last time we had a case to work in West Texas in the Davis Mountains. And my boss sent me out there. And uh, he called the client who was on a three-party line and told him what flight I was coming into Midland on, where I was going to rent my car, where I would meet him, and at what time. So I flew into Midland and I rented the car. And I arrived, I was about two miles from where I was supposed to meet the client, a mile or two miles from where I was supposed to meet him. I was supposed to meet him at 3 o'clock, and it was 2.55 then. And I rounded a curve, and there were two men standing outside of a car that was parked crossways in the road. And there wasn't anything to do but try to go around them, and I tried, and I missed, and I went over the edge of the mountain, and I rolled end over end for 90 feet or so. I broke my back in two places. I broke my left shoulder. I tore the ulnar nerve and ligaments out of my left elbow, crushed my left foot, my right leg. I spent a year in a hospital, four major surgeries, two on my back, and I'm now totally disabled in the back, partially disabled in the right leg. and. Uh, unemployed again. Roger Craig's life had become one of constant pain, debt, and limbo. Do you think anyone else is going to come forward and uh, tell it like it was? Or as I'm, they saw it? I don't know. I, yeah, I can't speak for anyone else. Do you think it'll help your situation if someone else does? Or do you think they too would be harassed and put down? I don't. If they knew something really important, uh, one of us would have to go. You can't have yeah. cooperating witnesses. It's. Uh, um, there are people who know something very important. I'm sure they are now. Buddy Walters was one of them that knew something very important, but he was shot to death here a couple of years ago. Now I have two friends that were on the bond desk. Uh, one of them was still talking to me. And uh, he died of cancer. And then uh, the other one, he died here, I believe last December, of a kidney infection. And then uh, there was another one that was still talking to me. And uh, they, these were all people with the sheriff's office now. And uh, he died. And uh, I'm not really sure what he died of. I called the, the sheriff and, and offered my condolences, you know, and, and, and all the sheriff had to say was he had more chain than he could carry, the man that died. Tell me what Roger Craig feels inside right now. 
What's he see for tomorrow? What do I see for tomorrow? What do you feel inside right now, and what do you see for tomorrow? I, when I get up, let me put it this way. When I get up in the morning, I say, this is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday. Roger Craig died in Dallas, May 15, 1975, of a rifle wound in the chest. He owned two pistols. The coroner's verdict, suicide. It seems so long ago Seems so far away But it's as clear as though Another man is gone He didn't last the night But he helped us see the dark 